Good evening, Western Standard viewers. I am Nigel Hannaford. We all remember where we were and what we were doing when we heard that Donald Trump had been shot. Luckily, he survived, but many questions remain. He was doing his job. I wouldn't even be doing this. Some beautiful place with a gorgeous ocean. Look, they're all pointing. Atlantic, maybe the Pacific. Yeah, someone's on top of the roof. Look. There he is right there. Right there, see him? He's laying down, see him? Yeah, he's laying down. And still I'm here with you fighting like hell to get a center. What's happening? And to make sure we take back the White House because if we do, we're going to make America better than ever before. We're going to make it. Yeah, look. There he is. Because we have millions and millions of people in our country that shouldn't be here. Dangerous people. Criminals. We have criminals. We have criminals. We have people that should not be here. And it's much tougher than if it happened. We have a small whatever. Probably 20 million people. And you know, that's a little bit over that chart. That chart's a couple of months old. And if you want to really see something, that says that you have to have a chart. This is Vanessa Broussard reporting to you live from Butler, Pennsylvania. We hear shots fired at the rally not 10 to 15 minutes after President Trump arrived. He hit the ground unheard of yet if he has been hit by gunfire. With me tonight is Western Standard publisher Derek Fildebrandt. Derek, where were you when you heard the news? I was sitting on my back porch uh, sipping cheap tequila. But uh, yeah, I, I, and I got the Western Standard news flash actually come across uh, my phone. So I knew someone uh, was at least working on the weekend here. So, yeah, some, uh, some of us were, actually three of us and four of us were. So anyway, yeah. great. Look, Derek, uh, you've just uh, written a column and you have titled it Dark Questions Arising. I think there are a tremendous number of questions actually that, that come out of this, this incident. Take, for example, is this failed assassination attempt a guarantee of success in November? Like if I were in the Democratic Party trying to figure out how we play this one, I think I would just go home. Uh, another one, we'd love to think this is a lone wolf, but did somebody leave the door open for this kid? Uh, that leads us into the whole matter of what happened that day and how could a security breach of this magnitude take place? when you have some of the world's most professional protection people in the business surrounding the president. You say what? So I, I guess on the grand, on, on the thousand foot level, was this just a lone wolf? Uh, was this a epic and monumental uh, breakdown in basic Secret Service protocols? Um, was... You know, was it, uh, to put on the tinfoil hat, was this a plan uh, involving the Secret Service or uh, maybe in between those two, uh, those two theories, was this allowed to happen? Did he act on his own more or less, but the Secret Service mm, just kind of turned a blind eye for a bit? And, and that's what I get into in the column is, is, is going through the evidence that we've got. You know, I, Nigel, I've tried... Uh, from the biggest, the minute we started the the Western Standard, I had a general policy: if I don't want to talk about Trump, I don't want to talk about American politics. 
a lot of Americans thought we can, Canadians can read that stuff there. Uh, ever since the U.S. presidential debate, I've been kind of glued to this though, and I and I've broken all my rules. I'm I'm now I'm now neck deep in the muck of this stuff. Uh, but you know, I, I'm I'm pretty resistant to conspiracy theories. I, I it, it it's water off my back. But very quickly, we started getting a lot of real serious evidence coming out of this. I mean, you've got roughly 20,000 people at this rally. Every single one of them has an amateur video recorder in their pocket. So there's never been an assassination attempt or uh, successful or not like this. There's uh, so much around. And, uh, you know, and maybe we want to kind of go through some of the major pieces of evidence that we have before us. Well, I think we do. I will say that right at the start that I come at this in a slightly different way than you do, because generally speaking, I take the view that just because it's a theory, it doesn't mean there isn't a conspiracy. Mm. Uh, just about everything that happens starts with a couple of people getting together and say, you know, we ought to do something. And then here you are, you have a conspiracy. But in this particular case, I am persuaded personally on the basis of what we know now, as opposed to what we may find out in a couple of weeks, that this is just one error on top of another error on top of another error until you get some, something where tragedy was very narrowly averted and good luck kicked in. But you are making the argument, I think, that there are some serious questions to be asked, so let's, let's start looking at them. First of all, the perimeter. Who secures the perimeter? So for, from, from what I understand, and I admit I'm uh, somewhat of a, what you call a prison study well, on for, uh, Secret Service first, protocol. Was this a hard shot? No. Uh, so for those who don't know guns, yeah. what was this like? So the sniper um, uh, Crooks was on a roof, uh, a perfect sniper nest. He can get in the prone position. So you know anyone who's ever made a long distance shot uh, most hunters aren't able to get in the prone position, lay down flat. That is the best way to fire a rifle at any kind of distance. Uh, <clears throat> most assassins don't have the ability to do that because they're they're operating in a more uh, they're not on a nice, relatively flat rooftop. This guy had a nice flat rooftop, and he is only 120 to 150 meters away. Now, I've dropped whitetails at twice that distance. While they're running, and now I admit I'm the last time I made that shot, I was pretty proud of it. That's that's a difficult shot, but you know what? I wasn't uh, I wasn't in training uh, for a presidential assassination. I was just looking for dinner, um, and Trump was a stationary target, and he's a bigger guy. Should be I mean, the guy was not far. This was a easy shot. Uh, now that that is to me the the best evidence out of the bit of evidence that we have right now that this guy was not necessarily uh, put up to the task by someone high up the food chain. I'm, I'm rewatching the X-Files right now, so, you know, the smoking man or something. Um, the best evidence that he's not put up to this is that he's such a terrible shot. On the other side, though, hunters will know the phenomenon of buck fever. When you, uh, especially the first time, you get, you know, a big target in your crosshairs, your hands get shaky, your steady's more on aim, uh, adrenaline is pumping through you. And I would imagine if that applies to a buck, it sure as hell applies to a former president and the leading candidate for president of the United States. So it's it's possible Crooks wasn't the utterly terrible shot that we're all kind of chuckling at him for being. It's possible he was a reasonable shot, but the adrenaline overcame him. But this was not a difficult shot to make. And uh, what about his decision to go for the head rather than the chest? I mean, obviously a headshot will do it if you make it, but uh, the better shot is normally the heart. Uh, it's, it's a much bigger target. Um, you know, with the head, it might hit the skull in a way that actually kind of, you know, might not go through, might kind of deflect. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you go for the heart, even if you miss the heart, you've got two lungs to hit. It's, uh, you know, and I'm not a forensic expert. I'm not a, I'm not American sniper. Uh, but I've, I've shot enough whitetails to know where, where you shoot at and, and, and know enough that, you know, the head is not generally the best place to aim. You want to aim for the upper cavity right at the heart. But uh, this was the perfect sniper nest where a guy could lay prone to get the perfect shot. Um, he could sit, he, he was able to place his rifle on the top, uh, on the pinnacle of the roof. So you now have a natural resting spot for the rifle. You're in a, pr a comfortable prone position uh, where you're not breathing heavy. 
Um, and it's only 120 to 150 meters away. How it would not occur to them to secure that rooftop defies all logic. I mean, I, I am obviously not qualified to lead uh, you know, a presidential candidate Secret Service team, but I feel like I would have known that. If they're like, Derek, you're, you're head of the Secret Service for the day, I'd be like, well, obviously, we're getting these rooftops an easy shooting distance of, of the candidate. So one of the, uh, one of the allegations that is doing the rounds on the television shows is that the Secret Service does not actually have the legion of people that we assume that it does, and that because of that, they rely heavily upon local police forces mm -hmm. when they travel. Now, I can't believe that even local police forces wouldn't have thought of that, wouldn't have said, well, we need to secure the AGR building. So that does open up the possibility that they forgot for good reason. So I, I don't think so. I, I've, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been reading the same stuff on you. I mean, all of a sudden, the whole world, we're all prison studies on uh, Secret Service protocols. Yes. But, uh, you know, the actual Secret Service agents are mostly in extremely close proximity to the president or the presidential candidate. They're, those are the guys you see, you know, jump on and do the hum human shield thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the whole, the whole operation is still organized and overseen by the Secret Service, and they'll utilize state and local um, uh, police officials. And it would be the Secret Service's job in advance of the event to go around and say, okay, these are the clear, clear spots we need to identify. Here's our perimeter. Uh, I saw a map of the perimeter. And it, it's a nice, clean circle. Then it's got a little Pac-Man mouth. And that Pac-Man mouth is the rooftop that someone made a clear decision not to secure. So the local police... They would be in charge of actually securing the outer perimeter. That you know, that's the Secret Service will use the local police for the outer perimeter, but uh, it's the Secret Service's job to determine what is the outer perimeter and what are the hot spots that they need to secure. And any bonehead would be able to look at that and say, obviously, that 120, 150 meters from the podium where Trump stands with a clear line of sight needs to be secured. It there's just no so way. Anybody who is Wanting to build a conspiracy is going to look at that Pac-Man mouth and ask the question that you're drawing attention to, why? Um, I, certainly in, um, in Canadian politics, these kinds of events are scoped out uh, weeks in advance by the advance team. I can't believe that that wouldn't be the same in the, in the United States, especially with, uh, when we're dealing with the Secret Service. So that, that's, that's a question that... Um, Smarter people than us are going to have to resolve. But the other one that uh, everybody is pointing at is people on the ground saw the man on the roof with a gun. Mm -hmm. We played that tape here in the office this morning and timed it. There was two minutes from when people first started well, When saying, they started recording. They must have seen it even before they started recording. Yeah, but when they started recording, recording. There's a man on the roof. Yeah. Two minutes later, shots ring out. In that time, we understand that a man was approached by a local police officer. This man is getting this. This police officer is getting a lot of criticism for backing away when the rifle was turned in his direction. But I'm holding judgment on that until we know what the standard operating procedures are. He may have been following the protocol that had been established by his own police force. Because I'm sure he didn't just back away and, and say nothing. So can you imagine why it took 120 seconds from the first time somebody said there's a man on the roof with a gun to when the event happened? Because as soon as the shots rang out, that's when the counter snipers nailed this, this sniper. Well, not quite. He, he managed to get at least five shots off, maybe more. Um, but yeah, like, so two minutes from the time at least someone starts recording. So obviously someone saw it, looks at it, and goes, oh my God. And then they start recording. So two minutes from the time they hit yeah. the record button, from what we've seen, and we've seen quite a few of them. And you can hear them yelling at police officers, yelling, uh, one guy says he was waving at the Secret Service, and he's, at least he says that they could see him, and they looked over, and they saw 
the assassin on the roof with a rifle. Uh, some people saw just the man on the roof. Some people's videos showed him up there with a rifle crawling up the roof to uh, to the spot where he could take a spot for the pinnacle of the mm. roof. Um, I, I, I can only imagine. But there was also uh, the Overwatch anti-sniper unit. Uh, now, that's unclear if that guy was Secret Service or, or uh, local, uh, local kind of SWAT. But um, the Overwatch would normally be Secret Service, I would imagine. These are top-end snipers. And you can see him in the video, uh, quite a few videos of, of, of the Overwatch sniper, uh, tracking something. Now, we can't say for certain he was tracking the sniper, but you can see that he's tracking some, something, and then you hear shots fire, and then he fires. But quite a few shots managed to get out before he dropped them. And I don't know what the uh, field manual for the Secret Service says, but I imagine when you've got a highly, highly controversial candidate on stage, and you know people want to kill him, and you see a man on a roof, 120 to 150 meters away from him, with a rifle, you drop him. Now, I guess the question would be, did he radio in for permission? But if so, what was the answer? Uh, did someone withhold uh, permission to, to open fire with the rules of engagement? Uh, but it's, it's another one of those things, is that incompetence or being allowed to happen. I, we're, gonna, we're working towards that. I don't know. But there's just so many monumental failures here that it's difficult for me to believe this is all incompetency because the Secret Service has a reputation for several things, and incompetency is not one. Well, you know, I, I, I am going to stay with the incompetency argument. And one of the reasons is that when you get to do something like this too many times, you don't actually become better at it. You become sloppier. Mm -hmm. And what this looks like to me is people who were so accustomed to that, you know, the, the advance was done, the, the, uh, the perimeter was drawn for a reason that may turn out to be uh, the end of somebody's career. The decision was made not to include that building, but... At the time, it seemed like a good idea. It'll be fine. We've got it covered from over here. You know, you might you might well be right. Uh, you know, I, I, I hope uh, so. That, that's that's the best that's, case scenario. That, is that someone was grossly incompetent? And then you then you add in the fact that the uh, Secret Service is understaffed. Apparently, we uh, we obviously don't know that, but this mm -hmm. is the reporting that's going out. And uh, to me, the clincher is that this young man clearly was no Lee Harvey Oswald. And uh, if you had been party to something like this, and I'm not suggesting that this goes back to the White House or even into a senior uh, uh, functionary within the Democratic Party. I think it's highly unlikely. Highly, it is highly unlikely. But it, if there was a plot, that's not that 20 year old. That's not the guy I hired. <laughs> borrowing his father's gun is not the guy that you're going to pick. No. Not if you actually mean this to work. Now, the other, the other theory, I, I don't subscribe to this for one minute, and I'm, I'm going to bet that you don't either, but, oh, yes, well, it was all set up to make Trump look good. Just wing him. I don't think so. No, I mean, like, the, first of all, you'd then have to have one of the greatest snipers in the world uh, to graze a guy. I mean, grazing, to intentionally graze someone, bloody them but mm -hmm. not kill them on their head, that would be an incredibly difficult shot. Certainly. That would be a much more difficult shot than actually shooting him in the head or shooting him in the chest cavity. Uh, that one, I mean, we're going to get to the politics in a bit, I'm sure. Uh, obvious, it's, it's, this is a political uh, triumph for Trump, the way, the way he handled himself and everything coming through. He's obviously gaining politically from this, but uh, I, yeah, no, I... I don't see any way uh, the chances, you know, off another inch, Trump would be dead. The only reason That's I bring it up, Derek, is it. that people are seriously saying that. And I, I, well, I find that... Uh, people on both sides are always going to yeah. immediately start to draw conspiracy this, theories out of this. I'm... Ex I am... It's I crazy put, talk. I don't put my tinfoil hat on often. I've just seen... I've seen enough evidence that shows in the best case scenario, best, best case scenario, most charitable I can be is its gross incompetence but I, I don't think it's outside the serious realm of possibility that 
at least some elements of the Secret Service. We're just um, taking a coffee break. Off their game. Yeah. Yep. No, something, something. Obviously, the fact that it happens means that something went wrong. As I say, my case is that it's, uh, it's uh, escalating incompetence at several levels. But uh, also remember, there hasn't been a, a shot fired, successfully or not, at a U.S. president or major uh, party candidate in the United States since 1981 uh, against Ronald Reagan. Um, well, Scalise. Well, well, sorry, against the U.S. president or, or, president, or presidential yeah. candidate yeah. from a major party. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there's been other assassinations, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, other you know, congressional leaders aren't afforded the same level of hyper security as presidents and presidential candidates. Probably shouldn't really joke about this, but when President Biden says there has no place in American politics for this kind of thing, he forgets Abraham Lincoln, William McKinley. Assassinating John presidents is an unfortunately yeah, very it, American, it, pre- a, uh, uh, very American tradition. Uh, unfortunately, and they always assassinate the wrong ones. Now then, uh, the um, let's talk about that. Can Trump possibly lose in November? Yes. How? Someone could succeed in assassinating him. All right, that's uh, not losing in November. That's <laughs> just losing. Period. Well, it means he doesn't win in November. This uh, is a huge. Let's be honest. This is a huge political victory yeah. for him to have survived an assassination attempt day before, two days before the big Republican National Convention, where he rolls out his vice president candidate. Public sympathy is with him. Whatever you think of the man, he performed heroically in the moment. Mm -hmm. He did not cower. He did not let them bundle him up. Oh, he's he's supposed to let them do that. Which he is is supposed to do. There is a protocol. Oh, yeah. That that was another breakdown of protocol, just for a little side. But he he wanted to stop to raise his fist and say, fight, fight, fight. And good for him. But the Secret Service, they don't. Once shots are fired, they're not taking orders from the candidate. They get him out like they, they shield them and then they get them out. They're not supposed to stop for that. I think that's a tribute to the force of personality that's at, at work here, which yeah. of course uh, was very evident is not present. But it put in, him at even greater danger. Uh, the Secret Service oh, allowed. That. Look, if there was one sniper, there could be two. There could be four. Very so close. that's why they do it that way. But he somehow overpowered them and got the fist up there. Yeah. Produced the iconic image that you speak of in your article, and uh, now he goes into the uh in, into the in, into the convention and this is a man who has been subjected to the grossest calumnies in terms of the russian hoax the 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 stripper things the 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 the, the lawfare that has been exercised an invented an invented charge which nobody could really define but he said if he sounds guilty then find him guilty all of this stuff has happened to him and he has not quit. He has not. He has not backed down. Then he gets attacked, and survives. I say that this man has got the White House in his pocket for a second time. I mean, if you're asking me to put my money down, I'm putting it hard on red right now. Uh, I, I mean, he well, what could he, go wrong. He was already headed there. Um, he, he was doing well before the presidential mm-hmm. debate, first presidential debate, uh, and then I'll, you know, we remember Biden coming out with his pants around his ankles practically, uh, just the greatest meltdown we've ever seen in a debate in any country. Uh, so I think he was already a pretty good bet to get there. Uh, he's got to be damn near unstoppable now. But, I mean, he, the Democrats could still change their candidate, and maybe that candidate gets a great honeymoon period and catches fire. Uh, you know, there's a lot of Americans who probably feel about Trump the way I do, which is... I like the way he owns the libs. I like the way he, you know, takes on the establishment. But, you know, he seems overly narcissistic. He uh, doesn't seem very presidential. Seems uh, often petty. Don't, just have problems with his personality. Um, and they would vote for a moderate Democrat um, who would just kind of steer the ship for four years. Don't do anything crazy. I think there's a lot of Americans who, who, who feel that way. I've not been his uh, biggest fan ever since he said John McCain was, you know, coward for getting shot down. I, I had a hard time forgiving him for that. But after, after this, the way he comported himself there, it's hard not to be romantic about it. Uh, I mean, this stuff was straight out of Hollywood. 
I mean, if this was in an actual movie, you'd say it was cheesy. It was over the top. It's unbelievable. It was unbelievable. You'd say the Secret Service wouldn't allow him to do that. But uh, he, I cannot imagine him losing now. But of course, anything. Can, it's still a long way to election day. That's November. We're talking like we're four months out. The Democrats could conceivably well, could, well, pick a candidate. That was going to be my last question to you: is if you were asked to advise the Democratic Party. What else have they got other than that Donald Trump is unsuitable for office? Well, they can't really say that anymore. And they can't say that anymore. So what have they got? Not much. Uh, They they won't go after him on policies because policy-wise he's more aligned with the American mainstream. Most Americans Mm -hmm. don't believe they should just be opening the border, letting 10 million illegals pour over and then uh, eventually start voting, uh, drawing on the welfare and health care systems. I mean, they've got some policy advantages, but uh, if, if they make this uh, into a policy fight, uh, they're they're going to lose. The one thing they had was that Donald Trump, you know, after January sixth stuff, he's a threat to the constitutional order. He's a threat to democracy. The problem is that rhetoric, even if true, it uh, especially if it was true, would legitimate someone taking violent action to save the republic, to save the constitution, to save democracy. But that's obviously hyperheated rhetoric, and the Democrats can't really say that anymore without being accused of continuing to heat things up and fuel another assassination attempt. So they, no pun intended, but they just lost their trump card. They, I don't think they have anything to play. Have you been saving that all this time? I've been saving it for years, Nigel. They've lost their trump card. How true. Look, they, uh, the, the Democrats are in huge trouble. There's no question about that, but they deserve to be. And to the point about, uh, you know, President Biden comes out and says all the right things about turning down the rhetoric and so on. And Trump has had some better speeches aimed at the Democrats, but they have used some language which in the hands of a 20-year-old misguided youth living in a rural backwater in Pennsylvania could well turn his head, and probably similar to youths elsewhere. But, but you know... You don't talk the, about putting a bullseye on somebody. Well, I don't know. The Republicans need to be careful with, with that. Um, how far... I mean, to an extent, they can say the Democrats have used overheated language that is, you know, mm-hmm. going to radicalize some people. They can say that to an extent. But I don't think at this point, in the absence of any evidence that they can uh, place responsibility for the assassination on the Democrats... The person who's responsible is the person who pulled the trigger. Possibly, you know, as we were saying, uh, some people in the Secret Service and the intelligence apparatus, possibly. We don't know, but possibly. But, I mean, it it could just as easily happen uh, the other way. You know, Republicans use strong language against the Democrats. And, uh, you know, a crazed Republican somewhere picks up a gun and shoots a Democrat. That also does not make the Republicans responsible for it. It does mean, though, that both sides need to be at least aware of how far they're pushing their rhetoric. But a lot of Democrats genuinely believe Trump. They're not just, you know, politicians say a lot of things for votes and to take down their opponents. Uh, But a lot of Democrats legitimately think Trump is, you know, the next Hitler and Mm -hmm. has to be stopped. And if if you genuinely believe someone's the next Hitler, you got to call it out. And if someone gets crazy and picks up a gun over it, it's L.O.V. Mmm, but be careful what we write in the Western Standard. Look, on the subject of uh, Donald Trump, we're almost out of time, but I just want to make this uh, observation and get your comment on it. You've had experience with hospitals recently. When you, if you were going in for a serious medical procedure where your life was actually in the balance and dependent entirely upon the accuracy with which the surgeon's knife was deployed, I would not myself care much about the personality, if at all, of the surgeon. He could be a beast of a man or woman, but as long as he is known for complete professionalism and accuracy and has a high survival rate, he's the guy I want. And it's Mm -hmm. the same with... With aviation, every every time we fly, we assume that the pilot is going to get us where we're going to go. And he can be a jerk, but if he is a safe pilot, that's the pilot you want to fly with rather mm-hmm. than, the you know, somebody who might be awfully good on the mic. So I see Trump 
and and I and I see leaders generally as needing to be very very good, and if they have personality characteristics that don't really bear on the job that we don't like, well, let's look past that. Is he going to deliver the goods for the people? How say you? I'm not sure it's equivalent if we're talking a doctor, a firefighter, uh, uh, things like that, because uh, the personality bears relatively little weight in the job. Leadership, personality, bears a lot. Everyone's had a bad boss. Most people have had a good boss. And everyone's had somewhere in between. And personality is is a big part of that. Uh, you know, there's been days where... I come in with a bad attitude. I storm through here and I'm grumbling around. I'm just, in, I'm in a bad mood and well, that rubs off on the team. So no, I actually- I, No, it doesn't, we ignore you. <laughs> I do, if I'm in a bad mood, I normally just do lock myself up in the office. But uh, but even that is uh, it reflects on leadership. No, I, no, I, I think uh, personality, character traits, I, I think these things do matter in leadership. But, you know, um, Donna Rumsfeld uh, said, uh, you know, I think it was 2003 with going to Iraq, you don't go to army with the uh, army, uh, you don't go to war with the army you want, you go to war, war with the army you have. And the same thing is with elections. You don't, uh, once the primaries are over, you don't get to pick the candidates anymore. You get to pick out of the men, you don't get to decide what's on the menu, you get to pick what's on the menu uh, once it's selected. So, you know, based on what's there, uh, you know, it's going to be value propositions. I think more than anything, people in America vote tribally. Increasingly in Canada and across the world, we're voting tribally. Uh, you know, we're not voting uh, based on religion and ethnicity anymore. We're voting on political tribes. And Donald Trump is a very effective leader of, of, of his tribe. And after the attempt on his life this weekend, I, I think there's a lot of people on the fence who, who saw the way he dealt with it. It was, it's not just a sympathy that someone tried to kill him and, you know, maybe you could say all oh, those crazy Democrats. Mm -hmm. It's not just that. It, it, it's the way he comported himself, uh, little grace under fire. And, and that can't be faked because there's a lot about Donald Trump. You can say, well, is this an act? Is this fake? Is this just because, you know, he's a, he's a showman. Mm -hmm. Showmanship is a big part of him. You can't fake that. That was genuine. And, and the whole world saw it. And some people who particularly needed to see it. Our, our enemies. That is uh, perhaps all the, re all the recommendation we need, but it's not our vote. Derek, it's been great to have you on the show. My pleasure. And uh, we'll do it again another day. For the Western Standard, I'm Nigel Hannaford. <laughs>